Hi. Welcome everyone um, and welcome to Physical Disability Australia's webinar, Vaccination and Disability Staying Safe in Our COVID World. Uh, being presented tonight by, or this afternoon, by Ambassador Dr Dinesh OAN. My name is Liz Reid and I'm the President of Physical Disability Australia. And it's wonderful to have you here to join us for this informative and incredibly important event. I'd like to begin by, on behalf of PDA, of acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we all meet this, this afternoon and acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge people with a disability who are living full and complete lives and those whose needs are not yet being met. And that we consider this and reflect on this um, and work together to bring about change for all people to have a good life. PDA welcomes you this afternoon for the webinar, particularly as Australia's looming plan to lift COVID lockdowns continues to highlight the importance of getting vaccinated. Vaccination numbers amongst Australians' disability community are grossly inadequate and the anticipated reopening of Australia will place our most vulnerable at risk. It's important that we are all equipped with the knowledge to make informed health decisions that keep us safe. In this webinar, Dr Dinesh will debunk the myths surrounding the COVID-9 vaccines and will address vaccination concerns share medical facts and speak from the perspective of both a practicing doctor and a member, an amazing member of the disability community. This, in this webinar, um, uh, I am, I'm, I'm sure that many of you have already heard of, uh, about Dinesh, but for those of you who are not familiar with his story, here's a brief introduction. Dinesh was the first uh, quadriplegic medical intern in Queensland having been involved in a motor vehicle accident halfway through medical school uh, that resulted in cervical um, spinal cord injury. After much rehabilitation and, incre and incredible testament to his positive outlook on life and strength of character, Dinesh became the second person with quadriplegia to graduate from medical school in, in Australia. This is a huge accolade. He currently works at the Gold Coast University Hospital and is a qualified lawyer as well, and, and founding member of Doctors with Disabilities Australia. A university lecturer, the 2021 Queensland Australian of the Year, is actively involved in many organisations and advisory committees, is a disability advocate and a, a pretty much all, all round totally cool guy. Mm -hmm. We are extremely grateful to Dinesh for offering his time, knowledge and experience to this webinar and we're sure that you will benefit from hearing from Dinesh about COVID-19 vaccinations and the important role it plays in protecting our country's most vulnerable people. I ask you now to take part in our anonymous poll um, to give us a snapshot of our audience vaccination status. Please click on the poll options at the bottom of your screen and make a selection from the listed options. Thank you very much. And I'm now going to hand it over to Dinesh. And thank you all for joining this webinar. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Am I, am I working? You are working. All right, good. All right, thank you so much, Liz, for that very, very kind introduction. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us this evening. So my name is Dinesh and um, as Liz said, I'm, I'm a doctor. I work in the emergency department at the Gold Coast University Hospital. <clears throat> the pandemic over the last, um, well, ages now has been a really interesting time for the community of people with disabilities. And um, recently someone asked me, you know, there seem to be uh, gaps in vaccination. There seem to be gaps in healthcare. There seem to be gaps in all these things um, when we're going through the pandemic as a community of people with disabilities. You know, the thing is, we've always had these gaps. And in times of crisis, our gaps are more visible and our gaps are more pronounced. 
And that's why we're able to have these conversations because they suddenly become so much more visible. You know, I was um, last year, I was reading a paper about outcomes for people with disabilities during disasters. And one of the few papers that were floating around was how um, people with disabilities traversed the earthquakes and tsunamis in Japan at one point. And there was a significant gap in survival for people with disabilities and those without. So in times of disaster and crisis, there is always a gap and the life expectancy is much less. So this got me thinking about a great many things, um, but these days, one of the main bits of discussion is vaccinations. So I'm just gonna have a chat to you today, a little bit about vaccinations um, from both a medical perspective and a person with a disability. Vaccinations have been around for probably over a thousand years now. Um, and some of the earliest records go back to the 10th century. Um, but it really started picking up in about 1796 when Edward Jenner started fiddling around with smallpox. <clears throat> and the concept has been throughout all this time is for our body or to stimulate our body to produce antibodies to a foreign pathogen and to kill it off quickly because it, before it can cause us illness. So our body is a pretty amazing thing um, and the defense mechanisms are even more amazing. One of the things that we rarely think about is actually our skin is one of our first and foremost defense mechanisms because it doesn't allow any pathogens to sink through it. Um, there are very few things that pass through and through our skin as well. There are extrinsic things um, like even its pH, um, even the things that are naturally on the surface of the skin, they act as a barrier. But internally as well, there are some amazing defense mechanisms um, being antibodies and other types of cells that get around and kill foreign things. So, Antibodies are one of the things that um, are an important part of the defense mechanism of the body. And vaccines are created to elicit an antibody response. So once someone gets a vaccine, um, it introduces, uh, say we're talking about the Pfizer vaccine, it um, introduces um, through a certain mechanism, a part of the coronavirus into the body. Um, that's not pathogenic, so it doesn't make you sick. And so the body sees that and learns to kill it and creates antibodies to it. So now your body is armed with the defenses that it needs, where if coronavirus enters your body, it can kill it off really quick. So we had a patient, um, and I can talk about it because this is, has been on the media we had a patient last year, and this was when coronavirus first started, right? So I was a doctor. I had a spinal cord injury. I was getting around the hospital, and there was just this thick air of uncertainty because it was this new virus getting around. The mortality rates were high, and um, it was a very, very severe disease. And <clears throat> I was wandering into um, the doctor's common room, and there was a group of the junior doctors standing around a CT scan of someone's lungs. And I went up to her and I said, geez, whose lungs are those? Because they were just sick and it looked like an unsurvivable disease. Um, and they're like, well, this is one of our COVID patients. Um, and that particular scan looked so, so devastating. And I wasn't sure how this person was going to get out. But separately, there was another. Uh, guy and you can look him up um, but he was in the intensive care for 77 days and um, the thing is when you keep a person in intensive care it's really resource intensive because we have to get into PPE it's really hot um, and it requires a lot of people. You have to turn these patients every now and again. Um, it requires ventilators, it requires a full-time nurse, all this stuff. So it's really resource intensive. And so um, one of the biggest things we started thinking about is, okay, we were able to keep this person in intensive care for 77 days, but what if 
we ran out of intensive care beds. Who pulls the plug? Who do we pull the plug on? Who, who do we deny care to? And these are really difficult questions. But it's a severe enough disease where in hospitals around the world, and I think it's happening, I can't remember where it was, but even last week I read a report from one of the American states where they've had to start rationing health care to people. So it's a severe disease. And the idea is by, by giving these vaccinations, our bodies produce antibodies to it. So as soon as it enters your system, your body is able to kill it without letting it get to that point where you need intensive care. <clears throat> so it's been done for a long time. And um, we've just got some new techniques of developing viruses which have come out because we had to do it really quickly when coronavirus came out because we needed a way out of this whole situation. So that's what vaccines do and that's how they work. They stimulate your body to make antibodies. And when a certain pathogen enters your body, uh, it can kill it off really, really quickly. So a couple of the things, there, there are discussions getting around and you can see it online and wherever else. So you, the virus can still enter your body, but your body just kills it off really quick. There's also mounting evidence that when you have the vaccine, the likelihood of transmission is a lot less. So you can... The current evidence suggests that you can still transmit it, but it's significantly less. Um, so uh, that, that is one important point to remember. So we're training the body to kill a virus. When the virus enters it, there's still a possibility that you could transmit it, but your body has been taught to kill these viruses off. So a few other important points. We are starting to look at data of the people that are in intensive care, in hospitals and whatever else around the world, because that's important, right? Some of our systems are becoming overwhelmed. Even in our own country, there are hospitals. For example, one of my friends, he works for uh, a hospital in a southern state. And out of the 500 beds they have, 160 of those beds or something like that were COVID patients. Think about that because we still have people having heart attacks. We still have people having appendicitis. We still have people having all these other diseases. These hospitals are becoming overwhelmed by COVID patients. We haven't got to the point where they have in some of the other countries around the world, but we've been under significant amount of stress. And the interesting thing about these patients that are starting to come into the hospitals, and I can give you some data from the United States. So um, in the weeks leading up to at least somewhere around August, the rate of hospitalization for people vaccinated against COVID were nearly zero in places like California, DC, New Jersey, New Mexico. So a lot of those states in the patients that were coming into hospitals were with COVID were ones that were not vaccinated. In Arkansas, it was about 99% of the hospitalizations were unvaccinated and about 0.06% of the patients were vaccinated. Alaska, it was 95% unvaccinated. New Jersey was 99.93%. So those are the kind of numbers we're looking at. Because your body is able to effectively kill off the virus quickly, your chances of ending up in the hospital are much less. You could still get some mild symptoms. You could still get some, but your chance of dying or ending up in an intensive care unit is significantly less. I don't know how many um, people in this chat today have been in ICU, but I've spent uh, a couple of times in my life I've been in the ICU and it's not a pleasant experience, particularly when you are put to sleep. And, you know, I still, I still, have, I st I still have thoughts about that. I still remember what it felt like. So you don't know if you're going to wake up, right? And I, I always think about that, what it's like for a person when we, put them on a ventilator and put them to sleep because sometimes you just don't know if you're going to wake up. But the goal of this is to avoid getting to that point. 
So vaccinations, they work by creating antibodies to kill off a pathogen that enters your body quickly without making you sick. And the current data shows that people who are ending up in intensive care are mostly 99% are unvaccinated. <clears throat> so that's the data that we have to work on. Um, there are a bunch of questions uh, floating around about vaccination specifically. And um, the team at PDA shared some of those questions with me, which we'll go through as we go as well. But one of the questions actually um, with vaccination options, which one is right for me? And it's so funny, you know, because um, in hospitals, as, ho as doctors in public hospitals, we don't use brand names at all. We use a generic name all the time and it's, and it's actually a part of good professional practice. Um, so when sometimes we get a letter from the outside saying, oh, this brand of medication, like, what the hell is that? Because we, you know, there are so many different brands. And so generic names are really good. And this is one of the first times in history where there's been such public debate about which brand of vaccine someone should get. So generally, if you are a person with a disability, um, unless there are other circumstances or some other select cases, most people with disabilities are eligible for the Pfizer vaccination. Um, and if you look up the um, Department of Health website, that is the um, option that's offered. So if you are going to get vaccinated and if you're at a vaccination centre, um, and if there's no other reason for not getting it, I mean, you can ask, uh, you can say that that's your eligibility. Um, if you're not eligible for that, it's a discussion with your doctor about which vaccination is right for you. And there's, everyone's different, right? We all have different um, social status. We all have different health problems and all these things play into which vaccination might be right for us. So you can have a chat to a trusted GP, which is always important to have. Um, and this is another thing that we're working on with uh, the community of people with disability in Australia is to make sure that we have good primary care and good general practice. So you've got to find a GP that you can trust and have a good relationship with. So that's a chat with them. And there's going to be um, a couple of options now, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca. So depending on eligibility, then subsequently becomes a chat with um, either your specialist or a general practitioner. Will I need to get booster shots was another question that came up. And at this point in time, um, it's a conversation that's happening. But in Australia, there hasn't been any guideline put out and there hasn't been any definitive guidance that's been given on that. It's a possibility, um, but we don't know for sure yet. Um, and I am not sure if some countries are already doing it. One of the other things that have been uh, thrown into a mix, you know, given, given all the challenges that we have in Australia, we're still very lucky. We um, still have things like the NDIS and Medicare and whatever else. But uh, there are parts of the world, uh, like in Africa, where a lot of people haven't even had uh, a vaccine or we don't know the true numbers out there. And there's this huge disparity. So there's um, commentary that says that maybe we should think about looking after the rest of the world as well, because there are people out there that haven't had any vaccination where COVID is running rife. So these kind of points come into the conversation about booster shots. There was a question around the vaccine making people infertile or unable to carry babies. <clears throat> Before COVID happened, I was a junior doctor once and... Um, I remember seeing this pregnant lady with pneumonia and it was the first time I'd seen a pregnant lady with pneumonia. And I started talking to our respiratory specialists, the lung doctors in our hospital, and also a friend of mine who's a lung doctor as well. And I said, um, is there anything that we need to do to make sure that this lady is well looked after or anything specific? 
and they said that um, with pregnant women, you need to be fairly careful with how you manage pneumonias because uh, there are changes to their lung capacity, they're carrying a baby, it can change the outcomes and whatever else. So in that context, the risk of having complication from COVID and COVID-associated pneumonia, for example, is far higher than the vaccine. And the current data shows that uh, the vaccination is safe and there's no different in pregnancy outcomes um, if you have the vaccination. And these are fairly large studies. Um, it's, I think one of the studies that's often quoted is it, it involved about 35,000 women in the US. So there's, there's a significant amount of data. Um, so these are some of the points. And I think one of the other things is side effects. Um, <laughs> So side effects vary, and there are common side effects, which are things like lethargy, you can get sore joints, you might uh, get, get tired, a fever, things like that. So they're very minor side effects. We think, <clears throat> and this is unconfirmed, but um, being a healthcare worker and a person with a disability and being in one of the first centres in the country to get vaccines, we think that I was the first person in Australia with a spinal cord injury to get vaccinated against COVID. Um, so the first vaccine went well. I even made a friend. There was a police officer getting vaccinated at the same time. So we were chatting, we talked about it, and we've been friends ever since. Um, and then I got the second vaccine and um, I felt a bit rubbish after the second shot. My mom got vaccinated and she felt pretty rubbish after the first shot. So everyone's reactions vary um, and you just got to uh, basically ride it through for a couple of days. You just need to seek help if they, if they get really significant and that's pretty rare. It's extremely rare. So that's a little bit about COVID and the vaccinations. I um, know that everyone who's dialed into this call, we're part of the same community, right? And there are still gaps um, in the vaccination drive. We still face potential risks from healthcare rationing, for example, um, because in some parts of the world, they give ventilators and intensive care to people who they think will survive um, or are most likely to survive. Will that person be me? I'm not sure because my chances of surviving uh, a severe infection like that is considerably less to someone of my age without a spinal cord injury. At the same time, I think we've got to think about other people that are out there as well because you have people with multiple sclerosis that have immunosuppressants um, and they're immunosuppressed. I don't know what the vaccination responses to people like that. So I have friends who friends with conditions like that who are worried. But I think it's important that we band together um, and we think about these issues and that we also think about all those people that are in residential care that are getting continuously locked down, all those people that are hidden not just from our site but from society's site. And I think that's why these conversations are important. Look, I know vaccinations, that conversation, it uh, polarises people. But um, I've, I've given you a perspective, um, being a medical person, uh, being a person with a disability and uh, not really having any better 5G reception in my office after having the Pfizer vaccine. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks, Vinesh. That was really good. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, a lot of what you had to say really absolutely resonates. I know I've had both my injections and um, I had I had mine before they brought in the 50 roll. So I had the AZ, you know. Um, but I think in order, as a person born with a disability and the medical journey, that I've been on, you know, like 40 procedures since birth, I've had a whole heap of different 
bits and pieces put into medical interventions and, and medicines. And I figure that's kept me going. Um, I needed to have an injection to do the work that I do working with vulnerable young people, but I also needed to have um, the, the vaccinations to ensure that the community around me and, and I'm safe. So um, thank you very much. Um, this will definitely generate a lot of conversation and I'm sure that if people have got questions and we can, uh, they can send that through to Tash. Um, but we definitely need to keep this conversation going and we need to encourage those that are medically able to have their vaccination. And um, thank you very much for your time. I super, I, I really do appreciate it. And on behalf of PDA and as, as our ambassador, you're doing a top job. So thank you. Thank you, Liz. Okay. And thanks everyone.